Welcome back to part three of our pre-recorded pharmacology webinar. So if you're here, you've already learned the 19 picmonics from part one and part two of this series, which is linked as a playlist in the summary below. Go learn those topics now with your picmonic premium membership. And now let's go on to the final part of this pharmacology webinar. I'm Kendall White, the Conjure Director of Pygmonic, and we're just going to jump right in because I don't like to say all that stuff at the beginning anyway. Nobody likes it. So let's jump into psych and some other just hodgepodge of medications for knowing your endings and all those key important points of things you need to know. Let's get started. Oh, look at this cute little pill character here with a little pain bolt. Everything you see inside what we're talking about today are going to be images from our Pygmonic learning system. Yeah, I know what it said in part one. I said it in part three, but there's some weirdos that start on part three or part two, whatever. We're on part three. Let's get started. So the first one, um, really, as far as a class of medications, are antifungals. Um, antifungals, we were, we were just talking about antibiotics, so we're going to talk about antifungals kind of along with it. Um, but antifungals end in azole, almost all of them. Now, what I want you to remember, antifungals are weird. Just because you see an azole, A-Z-O-L-E, that doesn't mean instantly it's an antifungal, because there's some weird ones out there that are not antifungals. Um, but mostly all A-Z-O-L-E's are antifungals. And we are going to see a couple other good examples as we're going to talk about here in a second. A-Z-O-L-E. So with this, you can remember this ant wearing a tie with this little fun guy, fun guy, and he's painting on an easel for azel, easel, antifungal um, easel. Just remember that, antifungals. Now, antifungals in general, um, you know, they sometimes can cause a lot of drug interactions. Some, you know, that's sometimes a th really important thing to remember. But most of the time, um, antifungals are just in an A-Z-O-L-E. Excuse me. Now the next one are antivirals. Antivirals are, we've got an anti-character with our little virus characters. Isn't they cute little virus characters, little cute little legs? Yeah, we know. Antivirals um, pretty much always end in vir. V-I-R. 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 There we go. Vir. They end in vir. Vir. V-I-R. Virus. V-I-R. I think you're following along here. If it ends in vir, it's in some type of antiviral. There are lots of them out there. Now, there are antivirals that don't end in vir. Yes, I know. Thank you. You've got a good example, and you're yelling at me at the screen. That's fine. I don't mind. We're talking about drug classes to be able to stay and make sure you know all of the high, you know, the highest yield ones. And always remember, vir, virus, antiviral. Really important. Acyclovir, valencyclovir, sodofovir, tenofovir. Here's our acyclovir picmonic. You can check this out inside of our Picmonic learning system and interact with it and read all about everything. But here we've got our A um, Cyclops apple with these inhibiting chains on the vi virus. Now, A Cyclovir, if you take I A Cyclovir, you're taking it for one of two m main reasons, and that's genital herpes, our herpes harp character, or varicella zoster, our Zoro zoster virus. So I hope you had um, shingles and not herpes. So. Mm, but technically it's all herpes, right? <laughs> yeah, I know, nerd joke, sorry. Anyway, what's important to know with um, acyclovir is a really, um, a rare question, not a super high yield one, but I see it every now and then, is that it causes, um, especially in high doses, a crystalline neuropathy. Um, so these crystals can build up in the, um, in the kidneys, especially if it's given IV, and can cause this um, crystalline neuropathy because uh, it forms these crystals. So you want to give it a slow IV, you want to monitor for urine output, things like that. Not super, super common, um, but just a side note, if you get that one, it's like plus 1,000 points. I just made up those points, they don't matter, but you can feel good at night, right? So another one, um, a specific type of um, antivirals are protease inhibitors. Now, when we said vir, right, vir, ends in vir, okay, ends in vir, it's an antiviral, but there's different types of antivirals. So one of them is protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors end in navir. Now, we've got our little navy guys here with our, uh, with our propeller ace to help you remember that, protease, propeller ace, and then we've got our vir virus or our navy virus, our navy guys, navir. So ritonavir, uh, indinavir, sequinavir, you know, I didn't really practice pronouncing lots of these names, but so it's just how it is. I get a little tongue-tied. Um, not really anything ex especially jumps out as far as protease inhibitors uh, that really is just going to, you absolutely have to know, just really just identifying that they're protease inhibitors um, and remembering them. Now let's get into some psych medication because that's, uh, you know, that we want to make sure you, we touch on these and go into a little bit more detail. Now the first one are SSRIs. SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRI. That's really important to know. Now, we 
This is an example for all of them, but a lot of them end in zetine. So we've got paroxetine, paroxetine, fluoxetine. Paroxetine and fluoxetine are kind of the old, oldy but goody ones. You see them very often. Um, then we have sertraline, citalopram, escitalopram, um, different SSRIs. Uh, it's important to know them, but it's really important to remember that, not just remember our zetine character here with the five silver tonic uh, selector, but it's, remember really important things regarding SSRIs. SSRIs, you're most likely to get a question on this. There's so many good, really good questions with SSRIs. Oops, I went too far. What are the really good questions? If I say SSRIs, what is the one thing you need to be thinking about? Not this minute. You need to be yelling at a couple things. You need to be right in the tip of your tongue. You need to be yelling them. You should be screaming at the screen right now. You're, just, you're ready to punch the screen. I know. You're mad. You, you got it. You're, you don't have it, do you? Well, let's talk about it. So SSRIs, the number one thing is that SSRIs take a long time to take effect. So very common, I mean literally very common question. Somebody comes in, they're complaining in the question about their medication not working, they hate it, they want to switch to another medication, and what do you need to do? Well, they've just been taking the medication for a week, and you need to tell them that SSRIs can take four to six weeks to truly take effect. At three to six weeks, I know some textbooks are going to be a little different um, because medications are a little bit different, but you know, efficacy has shown three to four to six weeks, definitely by four to six, they should be seeing some effect. So you don't want to switch their medication until four, after four weeks. But what's the other one? Well, the big thing um, with SSRIs, yes, serotonin syndrome. Okay, you've given a patient a serotonin selective, you know, SSRI. Yes, serotonin syndrome is possible. But that's not, that's not more of an obvious thing, I believe. What we often see a question about is regarding this is an antidepressant, so an antidepressant medication is given for depression. So if you're depressed and you're sad, well, there's a really common question out there that really says, SSRIs, what do you need to monitor the patient for? Serotonin syndrome. Yeah, okay, that's probable. But what would you worry about? Well, we give any kind of antidepressant, really it's really with any of them, but because SSRIs are very often the first choice, you actually have a risk, an increased risk of suicide. You know, whoever it is is depressed, they start an SSRI, they're taking their medication, and then finally they were so depressed that they just had no energy. They didn't get out of the house. Siggy caps, remember they, they did, had all those things, signs and symptoms. And now they're taking an SSRI and they feel just a little bit better because the medication is starting to work. And unfortunately, they have just enough energy to carry out that plan of killing themselves that they've been planning all along. So you need to be very adept. Don't ever be afraid to ask a patient, are you suicidal? Do you have suicidal thoughts? Do you have a plan? Um, see if they have ability to carry out that plan. Very, very, very important. I can't stress enough. It is never a wrong answer to ask a patient if they have suicidal thoughts. You never want to miss that. I mean, you just don't want to miss it because um, I feel like so many people are just afraid to ask. People aren't offended. Um, if somebody said, no, I never kill myself. Okay, that's it. Thank you. That's all you got to ask. Um, but if you didn't ask, then you're never maybe going to get somebody who starts crying on you, um, and then you dig deeper and realize they're severely depressed. Because um, people don't just run around with a depression badge on their shoulders saying, hey, I'm depressed, look at me. <laughs> it doesn't happen. You're supposed to be detectives. Put on your thinking cap, okay? The other thing we see very often um, is um, we actually see uh, decreased libido with uh, antidepressants, especially SSRIs. Um, so Zoloft, even though I don't like to use trade names, um, Zoloft, I, I heard a patient um, uh, actually call it no loft. <laughs> uh, no loft, right? Funny. That was good. I know. You're laughing out loud right now. But anyway, whatever it takes to remember. Now let's go on to another one. Another medication um, uh, are benzodiazepines. Now benzodiazepines, there's several different benzodiazepines with a wide variety of, of uh, indications per se. But benzodiazepines, we've got our Benz Dice character here, really great. And we've got our Z-Pam and our Z-Lam, because Z-Pam and Zolam are the endings for benzodiazepines. Diazepam, Temazepam, Alprazolam, Midazolam, Triazolam, lots of different ones. But you can see those endings are all the same, and they're given for different reasons. Diazepam, Valium, is you know maybe given for anxiety or maybe given to stop seizures. Temazepam is often given for sleep. Um, Alprazolam, Xanax, um, is often given for anxiety or, you know, to nerves or whatever. Um, and then we see Midazolam, which is Versed, which is actually a medication to um, induce anesthesia. 
Um, and so we see triazolam again for sleep. So lots of different ones. But what's the, what's the common theme here? Again, you just got to remember the common themes of things to really make sure you hone in. Memorize the drug endings, get that common theme. And that common theme is depression, respiratory depression, CNS depression. Everything is depressing down, making you calm down, not be so anxious. Make sure you go to sleep. Um, benzodiazepines are calming down medications, if you think about it like that. So what do we need to worry about when we give a patient benzodiazepines? Respiratory depression, going, you know, going to sleep and never waking up. I mean, these are types of things. But if you think about it in that way, then you're just going to be like, duh, that's right. Um, side note, pop quiz. What's the reversal agent for a benzodiazepine? Mm -hmm. So what's that antidote? Well, it's flumazenil. And we have a flute mace with nails in it to help you remember that inside of Pygmonic. Or Romazicana is the trade name again. Not so much on the trade names. Don't remember them. Flumazenil. Now, really important to remember, you have an antidote because of this respiratory depression, CNS depression. And because some people just love that CNS depression, then you often have a risk of addiction. Um, same with sleep medications. You see them um, being uh, addictive, you know, it's very types of medications you can get hooked on and then abuse them. Now, if I just showed you this image, show you the, the magic of Pygmonic, what would you say that this particular benzodiazepine is? I've got this triangle lamb triangle and a lamb or lamb triangle lamb well tri lamb triazolam so you can see how you can really learn um, images and help they really help you recall weird things so in this this is just the character outside of a whole pigmonic of images but temazepam or triazolam sorry is another sleep medication which is why we have these jumping sheep inside of the image but again we worry about respiratory depression so i've got my little inflated lungs down here for two reasons help me remember to make sure i say it and um, to help you remember it no, that was me. Sorry. Now let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about a couple other hodgepodge of medications. I get nervous. I get these. I get. I get. I don't know. I get the hiccups. I don't know what it is. I gotta stop drinking soda when I talk. A couple other medications. Um, one of them is sulfa-containing drugs. Really important point to make sure we talk about this. Sulfa-containing drugs. Now we said loop diuretics, we said thiazide diuretics in one of the other videos, but you need to remember that, yeah, they may contain the word sulf at the beginning. Seems like that would make sense, but you see sulf or T-H-I-A, you see that very common in sulf containing drugs. Um, you see sulf, they start with like sulfamethoxazole or sulfonylureas, those are sulf, or medi sulf medications, you can't um, give those. Now, why is it, why, if people are allergic to sulfa, why do they keep making these drugs with this? Well. Um, sulfur is actually uh, something you can easily bind medications to as a delivery mechanism. It's also cheap and easy, easier. I mean, I don't know how to actually make a medication and make it bind, but somebody with chemistry degree does. But um, it's, it's a very easy compound to make medications with, which is why we see it so common. Now, of course, we have uh, one of our artists, Alana, loves this image. Um, don't let me sulfur is our sulfur match. So every time you see a sulfur match, um, you're going to remember sulf for sulfur. Um, inside of pygmonic, so magnesium sulfate. Um, you see that lots of us have sulfate at the end because they're bound um, to sulfa again. So um, and another kind, another type of medication is HMG-CoA inhibitors. Now HMG-CoA inhibitors, we've got our hummingbird with a little coin A purse um, and we have him kind of pooping on this statue to help you remember statins. So simvastatin, atorvastatin, pravastatin, rosuvastatin. Sorry, I didn't see the other one on there. Those are statins. Now, what are HMG-CoA inhibitors? Well, HMG-CoA um, is HMG, uh, it's H actually HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors. Um, so we, it's a, it's an enzyme that works with cholesterol. So if we can stop this, we can or inhibit this, we can keep the body from basically synthesizing more cholesterol into a storage form. Really common medication. You're likely to see it. Now, if I give this medication, if I say statins, what's the first thing you're going to say? You're, you're yelling again, right? You're yelling at the screen and you're saying, LFTs, 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 LFT. I don't hear you. So you're going to need to loud, yell louder. LFTs. So when we give any kind of statin medication, now I really believe that they're going to be getting rid of this recommendation soon because it's just not so common, but you still need to remember very high yield um, that we want to monitor LFTs and, and make sure nobody has any liver problems because of the risk of um, increasing LFTs when you're on a statin medication. 
Also, we don't want to combine them with fibrates and things that cause the risk of um, muscle pain and myalgia. So those are the things we worry about. So if you said either of those, good for you. Another medication um, are analgesics. Um, analgesics, we've got our little A, nail, J, Z character, but they mend in cane. Um, all of them end in cane. Now, if you're going to look at me, you're going to be like, yeah, okay, they're esters and they're amides. Good for you, nerd. Anyway, the point is to remember cane are analgesics or anesthetics. And what they do are numb. And they work on sodium channels. And that's not, again, not so important to get on the details, but they numb things. So if I, whether I'm giving you Novocaine, which is a numbing medication we commonly use for injection in dental dentistry, or lidocaine, which I could inject locally or give topically, or I can give it IV, right? And if I'm giving it IV, or if I'm giving it injected in the skin, or if I'm giving it topically, what does it do? It blocks sodium channels. Yay, we just said that, but it numbs. So we see light, lidocaine, or our lion cane character here, um, to see it numb things. So we give lidocaine very often, very often um, IV, after a cardiac event, and it calms the heart, blocks those sodium channels, calm it down, calm it down, heart. Just be calm. Don't go into another arrhythmia. Um, we see that very often. We give lidocaine. We inject it for pain relief as an anesthetic um, or an, you know, analgesic, again, to reduce, um, uh, reduce the pain, again, blocking those receptors. Um, just an important a side note, um, anytime you increase pH or have an infection in an area, you need to use more lidocaine um, to get a more anesthetic effect because it's not going to last as long. Just a side note, high yield point, not so much at the nursing level, but definitely PA and PMD level. Another medication um, are PPIs. So PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. Remember we were talking about antifungals and we said azoles for ezol? Well, this is an AZOLE, and this is one of, the, one of the ones you need to make sure you keep difference. So we've got our pretzel, omelet pretzel here for omeprazole. And omeprazole is just another one. And remember, it reduces what? Protons. Proton pump. Protons are acidic. Protons create acid. Proton pumps. They create acid in your stomach. So if we take a PPI, you can remember omeprazole, pantoprazole, or protonics, um, esomeprazole. We remember those um, to remember that they reduce acid. PPIs work better than what, what medication? H2 receptor blockers. That's right. We've got those here too. Just remember that aripiprazole is not a PPI. Um, and sometimes I really hate when someone says, don't remember this one thing, and then that's all you can remember. But this is a different medication um, that's for um, depression and um, uh, things. H2 receptor blockers, we just said that. PPIs work better than H2 receptor blockers, right? That's correct. So here we've got our H2 receptor blockers. Now, we just have the medications here um, because you usually just see these three, but they're the tidines or the teddies. So we have cementidine and ranitidine, our little cement teddy character and our little rat teddy. Isn't he cute little nugget right there? His cute little face. Cement teddy and rat teddy. Now, remember these medications are H2 receptor blockers. So they block hydrogen, H2, hydrogen receptors. So they keep acid production down. Now, cementidine has a lot, of more, a lot more side effects than ranitidine because it's a newer generation. But remember that PPIs work better, and most likely they're probably going to be using a PPI anyway. But again, just another medication that you can remember. Tadine, cemetidine, ranitidine um, are acid-reducing drugs. Little teddies, aren't they just cute little nuggets? So with that, that's all we've got. Um, that's our three sections, part one, part two, part three. So if you just saw part three, go back and see the other two, weirdo. You started at the end. You need to go to the beginning. More importantly, what you need to do, stop, hold the phone. You need to click the button wherever Marley puts it. Just Click the button to subscribe. Um, definitely click that. You want to subscribe. You want to know what we're saying and giving you next for free, of course. Or you can share a video. Um, you can check out our free study guide, which uh, is involving pharmacology and everything we went over. Um, but most importantly, check out Picmonic. Go to Picmonic.com and subscribe. Try it out. But if you have any questions, hit us up at feedback at Picmonic.com. So that completes our pre-recorded pharmacology webinar. In this last part, we learned about the nine Picmonics that cover azoles, acyclovir, SSRIs, SIGI caps, benzodiazepine intoxication assessment, triazolam, statins, lidocaine, and H2 receptor blockers. Go learn these topics now at picmonic.com or on the iOS or Android apps. Just click the playlist link below this video that covers all of the picmonics that were covered in this three-part series and go ace that next exam. Until next time, this is Nurse Marley wishing you happy studying.